before we start the program, I want a volunteer to pray and commit us into the hands of God. Emmanuel Okang yeah. from Logistics Direct. Okay. I'm expecting to explore the system more. Yeah, resource observers. Resource observers. That we expect mm -hmm. from you mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Ask to hear your concerns. Okay. And the things you think we will do to improve the system. Mm -hmm. Because without you, we have no visibility. Okay. That is why we are here. Thank you. The more we also improve our services, the more you also improve our services. You see, this work we are doing, I always tell people that if you are not there, I will not wear this uniform. We are partners. But how do we do this in partnership that we don't jump on each other? It is coming together to learn. And then you also give us feedback. So if you are here by God's grace, and our call is going to be more than the global light on what you do, Please be more attentive and be able to um, ask questions or suggestions and then we will also uh, attend to, to every question or any doubts that you may have on your, on your business. Thank you very much. You all remember very well that there were a lot of uh, issues or challenges at the inception of the program. But, We've come very fast, two years on. Over the period, we have done some updates on the system. We keep making improvements. Based on feedback, feedback we receive from the key stakeholders. So today's um, session is to run you through some of the uh, major updates that have been done on the system over the period. And also um, hear from you some of the challenges we are having our e-tracking processes, some of the challenges we are facing and what expectations we also have of you. This is supposed to be a very interactive um, um, session. Um, we will not be doing a hands-on practical I mean, training, but of course, if you have your machine and you want to go through what, what we, are, we, are, we are explaining, why not? You can do that. And more importantly, this session is also for people who are already using the system. If you are, you are new to ICOM, I'm sorry, but you might not, you might not, I mean, flow, I mean, with the tide. Once again, thank you all for coming and encourage that um, we participate and, and open up with whatever challenges or issues we are having. Right. I, I want to believe that 2020 June, any of us here will remember what actually happened when we started in June, the little chaos and all that, and how far we have actually come. So I think it's, it's a plus for everybody, including yourself, right? So going forward, this is just to take us through an update. If we, we have a, actually a plan of uh, putting up a training for people who want to learn how to use ICOMS, for beginners, those who want to now learn how to use ICOMS. So once that plan is ready, we will communicate. Then from time to time, we will put people together and train them on how to actually use ICOMS going forward. Right, so I'll go straight into the session. Even though we started late, we'll try to keep within time so that we can actually leave here early. We know that your time is very precious to you. If you want to do any process in ICOMS, right, the first thing to do is to have an account. If you don't have an account, you cannot even start any process in ICOMS. And the account registration actually begins not in a system because you must first of all have a registration with customs, have a proficiency certificate, and all that. Have a company before you can actually do a request in ICOMS, right? Any company administrator here, anybody who manages your company account? Okay, so we have quite a couple. So I believe you, know, you, you are familiar with the stakeholder interface. The only addition we've added is that I think now you are able to know the status of people who are suspended and the reasons why they are suspended and even the reasons why the company account is suspended because sometimes you come to work in the morning you try to log in and then the system will tell you your company is suspended you need to find out what the reasons are before you can proceed to rectify it so when you go into the company account itself right where the company staff names are listed you will see this new but new blue button there 
which is view companies, view status and remarks, right? So once you click on that, I believe you all can see it's a bit blurry, but you can see, right? Okay. Once you click on that blue button, it will take you to another window where the reasons why your company account has been suspended will be displayed, right? So we have, I think, in my mind, we have three major reasons why your, your account can be suspended. One major issue will be that your company registration date has expired, right? So it will tell you. If it's a registration that has expired, the system will tell you. Then that's one you must go to PMP to kind of do your renewal. If you already started, when you go, they will restore it for you temporarily before you can actually get the final approval. The second reason may be that sometimes there's, there's an infringement. You know, maybe there are hanging BOEs, there's a custom infringement, one or two offenses that you've committed. Then an officer will go into the system to suspend your account. Okay? So that one, the reasons will be there. So when you go there, you'll see that reason actually there. The third one will be sometimes you have a dormant account, you've not been using your user ID. So the system, per default, would actually suspend the ID after 30 days. So that one, your company admin can actually go into the system and then restore you. But any of the first reasons that are described, that's why you cannot do anything about it. You need to go to PMP and do that. Now, I need to make something clear. When it comes to performing any action, if I say any action, anything that has to do with performing an activity in ICOMS for you to be able to proceed. So for instance, you submit a BOE, you need approval or you need classification approval, evaluation, assessment, you need compliance. If you, a company is suspended, you need to be reactivated. If you have a CPC that you need to link, it is not Ghana Link that does any of these processes. Because many a times we have people coming to us and they go like, they said they should come to us for us to do gate in, for us to do CPC linking. We don't do any of those things. What we do as system people is to diagnose the problem and tell you what steps to take to resolve the problem. Whatever action, activity that needs to be done in the system is done by customs. So please, let's carry the message along. If you have any error, any system challenges, you can come to us. But if you need approval of anything, it is not Ghana Link or ICOMS, right? Thank you. So the system will tell you the reasons why the company account itself is suspended. Now, when it comes to the users itself, the users, you know, we have the company account and the users. When it comes to the users, when the user is suspended, the company admin can actually go into the account to reactivate that user. Right? You don't need to call anybody. You can do that in your own system. So when you go and then locate that person, you know, on the row where the person's name is, all the way to the end, you see those uh, blue button and then the red one. So the blue button is for the role assignment, and then the red one is for company, the user suspension activation. Or you can even go there to suspend the person. Assuming the person has gone on leave. Uh, you, don't know, you don't want the person to use the account while he's at home. You can actually go there and lock the ID so that the person will not be using it while he's at home. So that red button is actually to manage what we call activation and suspension of the account, and even to revoke the person. As mean the person has left the company, you can actually go there and revoke the person and delete the person's name from your system. If you don't delete it, the person cannot be added onto a new company when it goes to a new company. Right, so that is the, the addition that we've added to the stakeholder management account. Right, so that is it about the stakeholder. The next thing we'll do is to take a look at some of the notices on our platform. How many of you know that we have the customs laws? All the laws, regulations governing customs activity in Ghana. We have it on our platform. Has anybody seen it? Anybody? That's strange, right. Did anybody, any of us write the proficiency certificate, the recent one? Any of us? You did. You didn't know we had customs laws and stuff. You could actually gotten a lot of appall from there. Everything is there. So when you go into our, onto our interface, not only the customs laws, right? Without even a login, you will see that on your left side, we have what we call info, right? So under the info, we have law information. So the law information is actually 
every single law regulation governing customs activity. Right, even how to get the process to go through to get customs account, CHA account. Every single thing is there, right? So it is very rich information there. We also have what we call the EOE. Every single thing you need to do in ICOMS to be able to perform any clearance at the port is on our platform in terms of PDF. So we, under single window, you come to, this is under clearance. So under clearance, how to create BOE, how to answer query, correction query, all those things, every single step. So we have the step-by-step -step process flow with images actually on our platform. So even if you don't even get anybody to teach you and you can read, this can actually help you and know how to use our system, right? So everything from single window to clearance to cargo to many other th information that we have on our platform. Right. I believe a lot of you haven't actually noticed because we don't actually take our time to go through. We, we know that you have, your time is precious to you, so all you need to do is to get your BOE ready, go to the field, and that's it. We have what we call UCR change request. Anybody familiar with that? UCR change. I want to know, what are some of the reasons why you want to do a UCR change? Can you tell us? At least one reason why you want to change a UCR after you've actually processed your BOE Right, so basically, if you have a wrong thing on the UCR, if you have a wrong name, so be the importer name or the exporter name, it will require you to change the UCR. The reason why you have to change the UCR is that, now, per the standard, international standard, UCRs are not amendable. So it is not that the system doesn't allow you to amend UCR, it is the international standard. You cannot amend UCR. Once you create a UCR for a purpose, if there's any mistake, you need to create a new one to rectify that. But the good thing is that if you have a BOE already, the system would allow you to replace the new UCR on the old BOE that you have. You don't need to create a new BOE as a result. So this process actually takes us through how to make that change. Now, we also have one or two minor issues that we can actually call us that we can rectify for you. Now, there's, there's one incident last Thursday, I think it was Thursday, when the I got a call from PMP. Somebody actually went there to link their CPC. I think it was a, an exemption CPC. So the person created a UCR, did the exemption application, got approval, and all that. So he went to Mr. Bento. Anybody know Mr. Bento? Right. We all know Mr. Bento, right? So he went to Mr. Bento. Unfortunately for him, you know, when he was creating the UCR, the importer, the country Ghana, when he was typing the Ghana, you know, usually when you're typing Ghana, GH, it's Afghanistan that comes first. Yeah. Right. So he was, he actually was tempted to select the Afghanistan. And sometimes, if you're not careful, you select the Afghanistan without knowing. Because it will come first before Ghana. So then Mr. Bento said, ah, your UCR is saying Afghanistan. Why? Then go to Afghanistan to link your CPC. <laughs> you know. So that one, that one, because it's a country code, you don't need to create a new UCR. Okay. It's a country code. So that one, when you call us, we'll be able to actually change the country code for you. But when it comes to the name itself, there's nothing we can do about it. Okay, so those, those, those are minor issues that we can deal with. Right. So we will skip the UCR change request because we are familiar with it, how to go about it. You need to first of all create post entry on the BOE that you want to change the UCR on. So once you create the post entry on the first page, which is a general page, you go all the way down, you will see the request button. Then you will put in the new UCR number and the request. The irony is that you need to proceed to the uh, system's office to actually pay 100 CDs to before you can actually get approval for that. Number of times that your BOE is queried affects the declarant in terms of your selectivity level. So you notice that most of the time your BOEs are going on red and red and red. You don't understand it because you are committing a lot of infringements. So the system records that information. So it records infringement on the importer, it records infringement on the declarant. So if you are compliant, if you submit BOE, you don't get any issue, it goes through successfully, your values are okay, custom doesn't temper with your value, everything is cool, you go through, the system sees that this guy is compliant, so it wouldn't frustrate you. So at a point in time, you realize that most of your BOEs will be green channels. Right, so that is how the system treats those of us who are compliant. 
and that is it about one after the other. Once you use a preparation application, you can actually distribute that to the various MDAs that you must submit to. And we also have the master. You know, the master is for master IDF and master concession and stuff like that. And then we also have the consignment application. Now, the consignment application probably may be for just one type of application that you want to do, right? The advice is that you use the preparation. However, if you do not use the preparation application and you go ahead and use the consignment application, and let's say you've done the uh, IDF for the con consignment application, don't worry. You don't need to, and then let's, you realize that you now need the GSA or you now need EPA. Because you didn't use the preparation application, you attempted to go to consignment and start the process all over again. You don't need to start all over again. What you need to do is to copy the first application that you have done. So when you go to the consignment application, so assuming that you've done your IDF already, you now need a GSA. Because you didn't use the preparation, you used the consignment. This is the procedure to go through. So you select your parameters, right? So you go there, you select your UCR, you select your But let's go back. Right, so you, right. Okay, so this is the consignment application screen. So once you're there, because you've created IDF already, you now want to create GSA, right? So you, you select your type, which is single consignment. You select your UCR, you select the MDA, which is GSA. The type of application you're doing, if it is electricals, if it is, uh, high risk goods, you select it, then you select the process. Now, instead of using the crates, kindly do not use the crate, kindly use the copy application, right? Once you use the copy application, the system will ask you to quote the application number of the first one that you did. So if you already have an IDF number, you quote the IDF number under the copy. Then you copy, then the system will bring every information onto the new application that you are doing. So if you need to delete some of the items, because if you have, let's say, 29 items, only five of them is going to FDA, you can actually delete the FDA and leave the FDA ones on it. So if you don't use the preparation, do not worry. You can actually use the consignment and then copy and copy as many times as you want, right? So that is that about the consignment application. Now, when it comes to the preparation application, you know, when you use the right HS code, the system would actually tell you which MDA that is required for your BOE, right? So it will tell you at the preparation application stage, if it's EPA, FDA that you need, this is based on the code that you have selected. It is incumbent upon selecting the correct HS code. Sometimes you select the wrong HS code, it will direct you to the wrong MDA. By the time it goes to classification evaluation and it comes back, you realize that you don't even need that application you've created in the first place because the officer has now given you the correct HS code. So let's try to make sure that we know the codes that we're actually working with. Now, I'll move on to FDA, right? I'll talk a little bit about FDA because uh, for FDA, we know that now they are very proactive, okay? If I say proactive, when you put in applications to FDA, it doesn't keep long. It doesn't, if, you, if, if, you have, if you have realized, it doesn't really keep long. They actually do the approvals quite quickly. The only challenge we have is our EPA friends. EPA is a little challenge that we have that we are still trying to engage them. Right, but let's go to the personal effect. Now we have a new application for FDA called personal effect. Personal effect, I don't know if any of you have used it quite recently, it's quite recent, it's about two weeks ago. What the personal effect does is that those of us who bring vehicles and then we have personal effects in the vehicles. You know, before you needed to go to FDA and take a code and come back to your office and now submit the application. That is not needed anymore, okay? So if you have personal effect, but please, please, I'll beg you, I'll beg you, our friends. You know, when Madame Nunya was speaking, she said that we are all partners. We are partners because if you do the right thing, everybody is happy. It is for personal effect, and only personal effect, okay? So if you, if you bring a container full load of FDI items, and you go and select personal effect, they will query you because FDA has information on manifest. They have manifest information. So when you attach a copy BL, they will see the details. They will compare to the manifest and see that these items are really indeed personal effect because it's coming in a container that has vehicles and stuff like that. So if you have, let's say, uh, 
delay mackerel full container, you go and say that it's personal effect. It is not, they will query you. It will not go through, all right? So the good thing about this is that it will not ask you for any code, okay? So if you have 10 line items of personal effects, two bags of rice, oats, drinks, stuff. Well, now the fee will be assigned. So this is a fee. This one is 150 CDs. So you can print the bill, and then once you pay, automatically you get the approval, right? So the hassle to go for code for personal effect is all application or to do e-waste. Sometimes it's a bit confusing, right? We get calls all the time. The unfortunate thing is that the system doesn't also tell you at application stage, the system doesn't tell you whether it is 042 or 148 because EPA is the only agency that has two units within the agency. So we have the e-waste side, the e-waste code is 148, then the chemical side is 042. I always advise, always, and it works. What you need to do is that, at least if you know that the item is for EPA, fine. If you don't know, just skip. Go to the BOE, the 042 or 148. It is easier that way than to go and do 042. Go and look for cast numbers, you know, I could drink cast numbers and what's uh, Then you realize that it should have been e-waste. E Notice that you have wasted your time. Probably you had even paid already. You won't get the money back. So it is advisable that you move on to the BOE at all cast numbers. You need to quote all those cast numbers under the item numbers. And then you print a copy of that document and upload. EPA would accept. So it is not necessary that you have to wait for China or wait for Europe for them to send you MSDS, right? But if you have it com coming with it, it is fine. If you don't have it, you go to Google and look for one, right? So that is that about EPE applications. Now, can anybody tell us the difference between what a permit is, I'm talking about permits, what an exemption is, and what a concession is? Anybody? I mean, permits allow you, you to just import a particular consignment that you are, you are using, you are then applying. 100%. And there is a concession reduces the, the tax value the, I mean, the, the duty value of a particular consignment when applied for concession and concession being abused. Exemption and safety on a particular country is being equal duty or bad or any other. Please give that for him. He has said it all. I thought he was going to say one for must be AP. But you realize that along the process, at the time you see AM, at the time you see AE, AJ, uh, but the final approval for all applications in ICOMS must be AP. If it is not AP, then it is not a final approval. So AP approved. Right, so this is a typical example of an exemption that has gone through three different departments. So the first one went to health, which I think is a pharmaceutical product. Then it went to DTRD. So DTRD, we have two people doing the approvals. We have the checking and validation. Then it goes to customs. We have the checking and validations before you get a final approval, okay? So that is it about it. Now, before I come back to permits, at the BOE and nice document registration side, which is a mandatory now, I'll speak a little bit about LOC, okay? Just brief. Now, we had engagement with BOG last week, my director and then myself, on two occasions. The thing is that they realize that a lot of people are selecting no for repatriation status. So, when you are creating an LOC, those of us who do exports, when you create the LOC, there's a question that would go like, would export proceeds be repatriated? That question must be yes, all the time. All the time. And under no circumstances must you select no. Even when the exporter has told you that select no, please do not do it. Do not do it because it is against the law. All exports that is done, I'm talking about commercial exports in terms of commercial quantity, you must repatriate the funds. Even if the person has paid the money before you are now doing the export, you must select yes, because that money has been paid. The money has been transferred already. So you are now doing the export. So the information on the transfer will be used to update the LOC. So do not select the no. It is important, because when the time comes, they will come after the agency, not the exporter, because they don't know the exporter. It's the agency that is registered with customs, and it's the agency they can trace. So when I come to you and I say that select no for repatriation status, you must ask him why. 
And you must not do it. If he has any challenges, he can come to us or he can go to BOG. Okay? It is important. So that is a question. It will ask you, this is the LOC interface. So would you, would export proceeds be repatriated? You have to say yes. It is only in two occasions. So we have what we call personal effects. Those expatriates who have come to Ghana for at the embassies and stuff, they are now going back. The items will tell for itself. So use household items. So anybody will pick it, will see that these are used items, right? And then when you are doing exports for sample products, so a company wants to get markets abroad, so they take small quantity of their items and export. Even in these two occasions, you need to create the LOC. You will have to create the LOC, but the status will be no, because in these two instances, there will be no repatriation of funds, all right? So it is important to select yes on the LOC when you're doing it. Now, for general cargo, you select 60 days. Okay, for the 30 days, it's for mineral export. That is at the airport. So not really at the seaside. So 60 days. The 60 days will not start counting when you create the LOC, no. It will only start counting when you have actually done the export. So maybe you may create the LOC today, select the 60 days today, but maybe end up doing the export a week later, two weeks, even a month later. It is only when the export is done then the days will start counting. Even when you have created the BOE, and then examination officer has not released, the days will not start counting, right? So I, I brought an export process flow for us to take a look at who, at which point the LOC will start counting. So when you are doing the export process, you create your UCR, then you do your LOC. Sometimes you may need permit for timber, those who do timber products, like exports. You need TIDD permit as well, right? Then you submit your BOE, you go for compliance, now we pay on, on export, we pay disinfection fees, right? Then CHA levy. Once you pay, you proceed to do fiscal inspection request, then you do your export release. It goes to MPS, it's gated in, and then once it is done, the gating is done, export, the uh, examination officer releases the BOE, gate out is done, it goes to MPS. That is at the point where the 60 days will start counting. So when the export BOE is not released and gated out, it will not start counting. So we have to take notice of that. Now, let's go back to the next the slide. It is only regime 10 that requires LOC, okay? Only regime 10. And it is mandatory in ICOMS, right? We have other forms of exports, which is a direct temporary export. We have re export about three, about three of them, or four of them. We have the 30, 34, 37, and then 39. All these ones do not require LOC, okay? Only direct export under regime 10 requires LOC. Right, but let's move on. Okay, now, we have what we call important name matching. Anybody without experience, important name matching error, right? So what are some of the reasons why you have to do important name matching request? Yes. Any typical reason why you would do that? Yeah. Right. That is on the BOE, right. Okay. Same reason. I think that is the major reason, okay. But we have it in about two phases, okay. The first phase is when sometimes, maybe the spelling. It's just the spelling. Maybe you have enterprise spelled full on the BOE. And maybe in the, in the manifest it is ENT. Sometimes limited, LTD here, then spelled full here. Sometimes Ghana, GH here. And, so ideally, some of these things, <coughs> we are still looking as to how it will go. But you have to do the request. Um, uh, attaching the permits to the UCR, mm. I realized that automatically GSA and then IDF uh, pops up by itself. Why would you do the rest like that? And then we have to uh, go and place uh, and then attach all of them to the UCR before they will then pop up by itself. There are two scenarios where you can select no for repatriation status. In cases of when you're doing export of sample products and export of personal effect, in these two cases, you still need LOC, except that the status must be no because there will be no funds repatriated. However, we are still looking at ways and means of restricting people from selecting the no. We are still engaging BOG. In fact, they, they have indicated that they are going to set up uh, a committee that will review, because we even advise that 
You know, with the inception of this African trade, this free trade, we are also even are advocating that if you do export within the African continent, the sub-region, the LOC requirement should be lifted so that at least people can freely trade and all that. So all these issues are being taken a look at. So once that is done, I'm sure by then we also come up with a, a, an update that would enable people not to select the yes when they are the no when they are supposed to select the yes. So yes, we are looking into that. Now your second issue. When I was speaking, I said clearly that we only go and attack because the permit is unapproved. Okay, I believe that those of us here can attest. Once your permit is approved, automatically it is uploaded to the UCR. So when it is not approved, there is no use for it to be uploaded to the UCR. It's only when it's, so realize GSA is automatically approved, IDF is automatically approved, and even the e-waste, once you pay, it is automatically approved. So those ones, automatically, to go and upload to the UCR, you don't need to do the manual up upload. It's only when it is not approved that you must do the manual upload to enable you and next to the BOE so that you can submit your BOE. And that is fair, and that is how the system works.